This is our fifth week of Easter Tide, where we remember the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord, and our union with Him in the same that we die with Him and we rise with Him, as some of the songs we just sang this morning focused upon. Um, in some respects, that might be a, a uh, interesting thing that today is evidently Cinco de Mayo, so uh, it's a celebration of, of, of death, so we can celebrate our death with Christ, but we also that can never be divorced from our our celebrating of our resurrection with him as well. Amen. Now we've been focused on the fact that Jesus's teachings, both before and after his resurrection, were focused on the kingdom of God. Uh, before his death and resurrection, he spoke of how the kingdom of God was very near, um, at the very door, in fact, he once said. Uh, he even told one group that there were some who were present at the time who would not see death until they saw the kingdom of God come with power. So we know that the kingdom of God Jesus was referring to was the actual kingdom, not the physical representation of the kingdom that will happen during the millennial reign. Is everybody with me? Yes or no? Okay, so good. So, um, and with power, that they would come, he would, they would see the kingdom of God come with power. And we know all but Judas uh, in, in that group at least saw that, plus uh, a good number of others, another um 108 people um, in the upper room saw that come with power. So uh, th that was a fulfillment of that passage. Now today we're going to begin in Matthew 4 and Matthew 9, reading a few verses which emphasize this point, and then we'll move on to one of the parables Jesus taught about the kingdom of God. So in Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse 12, we're just reading through verse 17. So Matthew chapter 4 beginning in verse 12. <clears throat> and again, we're just using this to see again or re-emphasize that the kingdom of God was the focus of Jesus' entire, entire ministry. Uh, it says, now when Jesus heard that John had been imprisoned, he went to Galilee. While in Galilee, he moved from Nazareth to make his home in Capernaum by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah would be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sit in darkness have seen a great light. And on those who sit in the region and shadow of death, a light has dawned. And from that time forward, Jesus began to preach this message, Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. So, the light that was dawning was both kingdom and king. The light that was dawning in the middle of their darkness was kingdom and king. I suggest to you that it hasn't changed. That when you we look at the world surrounding us that is in darkness, the light that dawns is kingdom and king. The light that dawns in darkness is not if you say these magic words, you won't go to hell. The magic, the, 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 the silver bullet that takes care of the darkness is the awareness that you've been invited into a kingdom by bowing knee to a king. And once you've entered in that kingdom, you are saved. You enjoy safety. Amen. But safety is not the point. The point is there's a king that's worthy of you bowing the knee to it. And if you will bow the knee to him, then you'll enter into his kingdom. And once you're in that kingdom, their safety. Amen? So, now, and the other one is in Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 through 38. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 through 38. And Jesus continued his circuits through all the towns and the villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. Oh, what a shock. And, and curing every kind of disease and infirmity. And when he saw the crowds, he was touched with pity for them. Aren't you glad that that's the heart of our Father? Because Jesus said, if you've seen me, if you've seen what I say, if you've heard what I say, if you've seen what I do, if you see how I respond to things, then you've seen the Father in the same manner, right? And so when the Father looks on these things, the Father is moved with pity, isn't he? Aren't you glad? I'm very glad that that's the heart of my Father. So when he said, when he saw the crowds, verse 36, 
He was touched with pity for them because they were distressed and were fainting on the ground like sheep which have no shepherd or people who have no king. Hello? Amen? Remember the, 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 the kings in Israel, see this is, a, this is a, a, a connection that the modern world doesn't understand completely. They can see how it somewhat fits, but not entirely. But the Jewish nation understood it very well because the kings of Israel were called their shepherds. That was, uh, that's, uh, David was called to shepherd God's people by being king, right? And so this is, again, an example of Jesus being king. It says, they, uh, but what was causing them to be distressed and faint to the ground? This wasn't a literal fainting. He could see their hearts. He could see the, the, the turmoil within them. He could see the despair that was within them. And what was it due to? They were lacking a shepherd. I, I don't know how many of you have spent time. I think most of you have in one way or another. So you've certainly heard me teach, teach about it many times. But um, <clears throat> and the, the excellent book we often reference is uh, uh, Shepherd's Look at the 23rd Psalm. You guys know what sheep are like if they don't have a shepherd. They're lost. They're in distress. They are anxious. They're filled with care. The slightest thing scares them. Uh, the, without doubt, in most cases, though not in all, they are wide open. Well, they're always open to pray. Most of them will probably die without a shepherd, but not always. There have been extreme cases where a, shepherd, a sheep has secluded itself, like in a cave or something, and has lived for years without a shepherd. But the end result of that sheep was not a good one. They were very unhealthy. Uh, they need a shepherd. And the anxiety that runs into the, in their hearts and uh, through their, the, the adrenaline that flows through their veins is something that's not healthy for the sheep. They're not made for that. Well, you know, neither you and I, we were created for a king. Amen. And so Jesus, when he looked upon him, was moved with pity because he saw they were fainting on the ground like sheep, which have no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is abundant, but the reapers are few. Therefore, entreat the owner of the harvest to send out reapers into his field. Now, Jesus goes on to give his disciples authority right after this. I'm not going to read it right now. We are going to possibly circle back and look at it later on tonight, today before uh, we close. I hope we can, time permitting. But Jesus goes on right after this and to give his disciples authority to go into the human fields of Israel as reapers. And what is learned from his teaching of them before sending them out will give greater understanding to our parable of focus this morning. All right? So the, what we're going to be focusing on is a parable this morning. And the parable is, a, is the one that you're familiar with, either about the talents or the minas, where uh, the, the, the nobleman gave that to, the, to um, his servants to do business until he returned. Amen? You guys remember the parable, yes? Okay, so that's the one we're looking at. And that's what the, this second verse we just read in Matthew 9 is really an indicator of. Jesus looked across and he saw these people as people fainting for lack of shepherd. And he's like, you know, dude, the guys, the, the harvest is tremendous. But the people that will go out there into the fields and deal with the people are few. I have few stewards. I have sh few servants that will go out and do the work of the kingdom. And so immediately after this, Jesus did something about it by giving authority to his disciples to go out by twos out into Israel and heal the sick and, 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 and um, deliver the, uh, from demonic spirits and to preach the kingdom of God to the shepherd, the sheep that needed a shepherd. Amen. So that's what he, that was his solution, was sending them out. Give them authority and send them out. And he gave them some instructions on sending them out that told them what to do and how to do it. And I think that when we look at that, when we circle back and look at his instructions he gave us, it'll cause us to better understand how to live out the parable we're learning this morning. Is everybody with me? Okay. So we're, 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 we've stopped there in verse 30, uh, 38, which is the end of that chapter. We'll go to chapter 10, hopefully, before we close out today. Uh, again, the, the time permitting. But um, now, for now, we're going to, to shift gears and move on to the parable of Jesus that begins in Luke chapter 19, verse 11. So go ahead and turn there now. Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 11. And it bears down upon what we just read. 
Then uh, we'll circle back to, 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 um, to Matthew 10, if, again, time permitting. Uh, now, this parable that we read in Luke 19 has a similar par parable, which is found in Matthew 25, which you are not going to read this morning. We might read it next week. It just depends on what the Lord leads me to do. These two parables may be the exact same incident, only recounted a little differently, but I believe there's actually two se uh, similar teachings offered on two separate occasions. Luke uses amina as the unit of money, while Matthew uses the talent. That alone would not make these separate um, parables. It would just be a different way of representing the same thing. It'd be like me saying credit card and another person saying money. It's still the same idea. Okay, so that doesn't make it a separate uh, parable. Luke, however, has 10 servants to which uh, um, the, the, um, the nobleman gave one mina each, while Matthew has only three servants to whom was given 10, 5, and 1 talent, respectively. Uh, both parables are otherwise nearly identical, except the result of the last servant is more clearly defined in Matthew than it is in Luke. But otherwise, these two parables are almost identical. Again, this may be the exact same event since both occurred just before Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Um, or they may simply be a reworking and a retelling of the same parable to a separate crowd. You know, we do this all the time, uh, even in the natural world. Uh, and, and since he was about to be hailed um, as king and then crucified as their king, um, it would make sense that in the weeks leading up to the final week of Jesus' life, he would make use of parables like this pretty regular. So it's very possible this was two separate crowds, and he essentially just said a similar parable two different times. Uh, but in the one before us, in Luke 19, immediately um, it, Jesus' telling of this parable immediately followed an encounter. His only recorded encounter was Zacchaeus, the, um, the chief tax collector. And Zacchaeus is very public repentance. Now, I think that that's an important key. Because when you're looking at Luke, just before we read this parable, before Jesus gives this parable, it was right after a very, very public display of repentance from a known and notoriously hated Jewish man. Uh, and, but his, his repentance was genuine. <laughs> and, and Jesus acknowledged that by saying salvation has happened in this man. Genuine salvation. Amen. So it was a great segue into his lordship, a good segue into his kingdom. Amen. The repentance of Zacchaeus was a direct revelation of the lordship of Jesus and the establishment of his kingdom in a heart. And so it was after that that Jesus began to say this parable. So we're going to start there in 19, verse 11, Luke 19, starting in verse 11. While the people were listening to these things, Jesus proceeded to tell a parable. Now, what things was he listening to? I didn't read the parable, but I'll quickly tell you what it was like. You guys remember where he met him. He was up in a tree and all that. But what, what happened when Jesus was passing by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and he said, come down uh, from, the, from the tree, Zacchaeus, because... I have to be at your house today. And, and Zacchaeus came down out of the tree and, and, and in a very public display of repentance, he said, uh, he called him Lord, which is important. Most people called him rabbi. He called him Lord. Okay. And he, and he said, he said, you know, I have, uh, um, uh, that, uh, he said, I'm going to give half of my, my wealth to the poor. And if I have wronged any man, I will pay him back four times what I've taken. And Jesus said, surely salvation has come to this man. Amen. <laughs> but I want you to notice the two elements. There was a surrendering to Jesus, an acknowledgement of his lordship. And then there was follow through. It affected what he did. Amen. Did it. Now this was now you can imagine because this guy was hated. He was very notorious, very well known. No one had to say who was Zacchaeus. Everybody knew who Zacchaeus was. Amen. You see what I'm saying? He was he was he was the guy who was over the other guys who go over there and knock on your door and rip money out of your your hands and food out of your children's mouth. Okay, this was the guy. He was not just a tax collector. He was the chief tax collector. He was much hated. Okay. And he just repented. So you can imagine 
the response of the people. Some people were probably rejoicing. Others were probably sitting back in skepticism. Well, we'll see if he really repented. And of course, the Pharisees were sitting there, you guarantee, with their arms crossed, saying, who are you to forgive this man and say salvation has come to him? You know, I mean, you have, it runs the gamut. So you can imagine, I, the reason I'm doing this, I want you to recognize the crowd was in upheaval. This was a major issue that just happened right in front of them. And Jesus saw this by the Holy Spirit as an opportunity to preach the kingdom of God. And so he began with the parable we're reading this morning. So in verse 12, it says, Therefore he said, oh, now, now let me finish reading. I'm reading verse 11 one more time because this is important. Because again, this was just before the triumphant entry, which is another reason why I believe that Matthew's is a separate account because if Matthew, Matthew was less known for being chronological. Luke is better known for being chronological. Um, but at least in the chapters as it's unfolded in Matthew, um, Jesus is telling of a parable similar to this with the talents doesn't happen until about the middle of the week after he'd already entered the city. So, um, but again, Matthew is not chronological. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that that's when he actually taught that lesson. Okay. But nonetheless, it says, but because that's about to happen, listen to what Jesus said. He says, while the people were listening to these things, all this upheaval, Jesus proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. Okay. And, and now, and ironically, they were right, weren't they? Isn't that what Jesus has been telling them for years? The kingdom of God is at the very door. It's right here. Amen. But the problem is the kingdom that they were looking for was a natural, physical kingdom, which is not what they were going to get because Jesus said, the ki my kingdom is not of this world. Amen. Now, it says, so therefore he said, a nobleman went to a distant country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. And he summoned 10 of his, his slaves or servants, gave them 10 minas and said to them, do business with these until I come back. So we start off with a nobleman, right? And, and he went to a distant country. He went away to receive a king for himself, a kingdom, and then return. Now you need to understand to these Jewish people, this had a ring of something very political to them because of the fact that this had just happened to them in the natural. When Herod died, um, four of his descendants, um, I think some people might question the, the heritage of a few of them, but nonetheless, four of them were be became tetrarchs in his place. And one of them was over Judea, and he was a pretty nasty person. As soon as he received power, one of the first things he did was slaughter a bunch of Jews, Okay. And then he had to go and report to Caesar in order to receive power to rule over the kingdom of Judah. So you have a nobleman who goes away to receive authority to become to be king of a kingdom. Is it can you see the, the connection between what Jesus is saying and what they had just experienced in the last X number of years of their lives? Okay. And so uh, so he had their attention. You just had a notorious person that we all hate who steals our money and you just forgave him and now you're talking about a kingdom and a nobleman who sounds a lot like the guy who's been killing us. Yeah. So do you think he had their attention? Oh yeah. Okay, so he says, a nobleman went to a distant country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. And he summoned 10 of his slaves, gave them 10 minas and said to them, do business with these until I come back. But his citizens hated him, just like the Judeans hated that Tetrarch, and sent a delegation after him saying, we do want, not want this man to be king over us. And that's exactly what happened in the natural um, in, in Judea. When this guy went to Caesar to receive power to reign over Judea, Judea a, a, a delegation of Jewish people, I think it was 50 people, went, went up there and petitioned Caesar to not give him this authority. We don't want this man to rule over us. So can you see, this is a direct comparison with what just happened in their lives, all right? <clears throat> he says, but his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we don't want this man to be king over us. When he returned after receiving the kingdom, he summoned his, uh, these slaves to whom he had given the money. He wanted to know how much they had earned by trading. Now, this is where Jesus' parable 
diverged from what happened in their life because Caesar did not wind up giving this tetrarch power. Okay, he did maintain his status as a. It's kind of like today in 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 America where a person can be removed from a position of authority, but really they still have a ton of influence and they're still making a ton of money. Okay, and that's what happened with this tetrarch. He really didn't. He had essentially been defanged, but he was still a threat on some level. Okay, and he still had some type of power. But, and that's where this diverges because the parable, in Jesus' parable, the nobleman actually receives authority to be king. Okay, so it says, but his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we don't want this man to be king over us. When he returned after receiving the kingdom, he summoned these slaves to whom he had given the money. He wanted to know how much they had earned by trading. So the first one came before him and said, sir, your mina has man made 10 minas more. So that gives us a better understanding of what happened at the beginning. Because it says he brought 10 of his servants and he gave them 10 minas, which could mean he gave 10 to each of them or he gave one to each of them. Okay. Here it becomes clear that he gave one to each one of them. Okay. So it says the first one came to him and said, sir, your mina, not your minas, your mina, the one you gave me, right, has made 10 minas more. And the king said to him, well done, good slave, because you have been faithful in a very small matter, you will have authority over 10 cities. Well, that's quite, that's quite the promotion, right? From, 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 uh, from dealing with, uh, with, with money to having authority over 10 cities. That's quite the, the upgrade. Then the second one came to him. Now, I read the other day that that's a, that was a 1,000 fold increase. So this was not a minor issue. I mean, that's a large increase. Then the, uh, um, then the second one came to him and said, Sir, your mina has made five minas more. Well, that's a 500-fold increase. So the king said to him, You are to be over five cities. Then another sl the other slave came and said, Sir, here is your mina that I put away for safekeeping in a piece of cloth. For I was afraid of you because you are a severe man. You withdraw what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. Well, that tells me the servant really didn't know him very well, did he? He didn't know him very well. Now, you, he does he does um, uh, um, uh, um, withdraw uh, what he didn't deposit in that what you deposit winds up making an increase. And so you wind up reaping more than you put in, right? Okay, so in that respect, you could say that. But he didn't reap what he hadn't sown. He always whatever he was whatever he was getting an abundant um, uh, um, an abundant harvest from was something that he sowed. It was his, wasn't it? Okay. So this was a misrepresentation of his character, wasn't it? And the king said to him, "I will judge you by your own words, you wicked slave." All right. I can already tell this is not going to end well, right? So you know, you knew, did you? that I was a severe man, withdrawing what I did not deposit and reaping what I didn't sow. Why then did you put my money in the bank? Why didn't you put your, my money in the bank so that when I returned, I could have collected it with interest? And he said to his attendants, take the mina from him and give it to the one who has 10. But they said to him, sir, he already has 10 mina minas. He said, I tell you that everyone who has will be given more. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have will be taken away. But as for these enemies of mine who did not want to make me their king, bring them here before me and slaughter them in front of me. Now, if you remember, I told you that the following, that following Matthew 9, where Jesus said that the harvest was great, but the laborers were few. Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest, he will send laborers into his harvest. Jesus went on to chapter 10 to expound upon this labor and what that entailed. So go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 10. But I'm going to go ahead and comment a little bit on this, this passage. I know we did just a, a, as we were going through a little bit. But obviously, I mean, I think that the, the, the analogy is pretty obvious. But one thing that I really want to press down on you, and again, not too hard, because like I said last week, I don't like to overplay this. But at the same time, when the scripture mentions it, I can't just sweep it aside. Are oh, you see what I'm saying? That would be improper in teaching. All of those that he gave meanings to were his servants. All of them. Not, not some of them. All of them were. Amen? 
Th these were not enemies. They were servants. And so this is representation of people who were in the kingdom. Yes or no? Yes. Okay. I'm not the servant of a, of a kingdom. I'm not part of it. No one could say I'm a servant or a slave of Spain. I've never been there. And even if I visited there, I'd be a tourist, not a, a citizen, right? I, I, I can only become the servant of a slave of someone I belong to. Amen? So these people belong to him. And so that's a big deal. That's important to understand. He, what he's essentially saying is what we've been talking about for a while, and that is whoever partakes of Christ or is connected to the vine must bear some fruit. Even if it's very little, they have to produce something. Right? I mean, even the thief on the cross produced something, didn't he? Because what he did was he made a public a public declaration of Jesus Christ right there in front of everybody. Right? Amen? Yes. And, and, and an appeal to him and recognizing him as king in a legitimate kingdom and asking him, would you, would you honor me? Give me the, the honor that I've not earned and remember me when you go into your kingdom. He was acknowledging the lordship of Jesus Christ as a witness before everyone in front of him. That guy did more witnessing that day than Chris, some Christians do in 60 years of their life. Right? So, so th there, was a, there was a testimony to Christ there, wasn't there? There was some fruit, amen, from his union. Now, so uh, not only that, but you know, that... that there's, it seems to be a direct correlation between what you do with what God gives you and what God will give you as a reward in the end. I mean, I'm not the one that said that. It's right here, isn't it? I mean, uh, it, it, the one received, all of them received one. The guy that, that did more with it received 10 cities. The guy who did a lot with it but less received five. The guy that did nothing was thrown out, right? So it's a it's a it's a very sobering parable, I think. So uh, have you gotten to Matthew ten yet? Okay, so Matthew ten, starting in verse one, it says Jesus called his twelve disciples right after saying that you know the harvest is great, uh, therefore pray the Lord of the harvest he'll send forth uh, laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus called his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits. So authority. That's a kingdom term, isn't it? It's a kingdom term. Jesus called his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits so that they could cast them out and heal every kind of disease and sickness. Now, it has been a lot of years since I taught it. It was the very first thing I think I began to teach after we had almost a year of teaching about elders in our church when we made the transition X number of years ago, which I think was 2009, believe it or not nearly 15 years ago. Um, okay. But when I, I, I taught for almost a year on elders, because there was a lot to know about elders, and, and to, re, to reorient our thinking about church and pastors and stuff like that with scripture, right? But then right after that, I started teaching on the kingdom of God. And one of the things I bore down on pretty hard by using Jesus as an example and going through every single example in the New Testament about it, directly connected. One thing that we found back then in that study was that in a direct connection to the preaching and the teaching of the kingdom was an illustration of the rule and the power of God by healing the sick and delivering people from demonic spirits. Those two things always accompanied the preaching of the gospel to the lost. Okay, and by that we mean the lost of the house of Israel, right? So be with me, yes or no? You follow that, okay? That's very important because if it's the same message today, then when we share the gospel with the lost, we have a right to anticipate that they we have the ability to lay hands on the sick and they recover if you're preaching. Now, that's not necessarily the case with people who are already born again in the kingdom because they already have a direct connection to the Father, don't they? And you also notice in Jesus' ministry, he didn't pull rabbits out of, hat, out of hats two days in a row. He did it once, right? Remember those people followed him the very next day? And he said, uh, you're following me, but not because you were convinced that I'm Messiah, I'm Messiah through the signs, but because you want me to pull another rabbit out of a hat. And I'm not going to give it to you. Only a wicked generation demands a sign, right? 
and no sign will be given it. So, you know, this is not something that you can do over and over and over again, but evidently, and again, what am I basing this on? I'm not basing this on a formula that's spelled out in scripture, but by seeing it over and over and over again in the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ and in the apostles, when they went out and were rubbing shoulders with the lost and taught the scriptures and taught the kingdom of God, accompanying with that was signs of wonders and power displaying the kingdom of God. If you remember, John the Baptist, when he was in prison, became a little down, as you can imagine, and began to wonder, you know, have I been doing the right thing this whole time? And I was so sure at the time I was doing it, but now I begin to wonder, is, is Jesus, is my, is my relative really the Messiah? And so he sent his disciples out there to, to find Jesus and ask him, are you the Messiah or are, we, or are we waiting for another? And Jesus told his disciples to just follow him around that day. And it says, Jesus went about teaching the kingdom of God and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of diseases and even raised the dead and de delivered people from demonic spirits. And when he was done, he turned to John's disciples and said, tell your master, tell your your um, your teacher what you've seen, that the deaf have been healed, the lame walk, that the people with demonic spirits have been set free, and that the dead are raised, and the kingdom of God has been preached. And blessed are those who are not offended at me. Meaning, in other words, blessed are those who are not do not stumble to the point of falling away because of what it costs to follow me. And of course, not too many days later, he was beheaded, right? So, but I want you to see what Jesus gave as an attestation that the kingdom was coming. Healing the sick, delivering demon, from demonic spirits, the rule of God. Now, again, <clears throat> this is not, this is what I also taught another lesson called, is the kingdom of God a bait and switch? Because once you, you know, there's a lot of things when you have not entered into the kingdom of God that God will do for people to cause them to realize that he really is God and that there really is a kingdom. But once you're in the kingdom, you, you, I, it's been my experience and I have seen it from other people since I've been born again, which has been most of my life. A great number of people I've talked to have found, have you know, testified that when they first were born again, their prayers got answered pretty darn quick. But as they grew in Christ, it seemed, it seemed like they got cut off, you know, <laughs> like, you know, before I just had to barely mention something and bam, it was done. And now it seems like, you know, I've reached my quota. I don't know what's going on. And of course, what they don't realize uh, and uh, hopefully eventually learn is that, you know, God expects maturity. He expects you to grow up. He, you know, he does throw a few freebies out, but after a little while, he expects faith. Right? Amen. Isn't it, it, and haven't seen that, haven't we seen that even in the Old Testament over and over and over again, beginning with, with Israel, right? He called them out by a mighty hand in Egypt, and he worked lots of miracles to get them out there. And then once they were in the wilderness, he gave them two more freebies, and that was feeding them with food from heaven and giving them water from a rock. And then at that point, he asked them to start trusting him. And that's when everything went sideways. And that, that, that's the way it is with us. We're fine as long as it's a free ride. But as soon as God expects us to actually trust him, all of a sudden, things don't work so well anymore. And Jesus said, you know, I got news for you. You don't even, I'm not looking for a lot of trust. If you just had one the size of a mustard seed, you could move a mountain. So you can imagine how much faith you're showing me, right? So, so you know, that, that's a, a pivotal issue, I think. So, I mean, don't, I don't want you to lose sight of that because as we're moving forward, we're looking at these things. You're like, well, wait a minute, I don't know where all this power is. I've been born again forever and I don't see that stuff happening in my life. Well, you know, you might not realize how much power you already have. What's already being shown you. One of the biggest things is that you don't have to have someone cast a demon out of you because demons can't get in you anymore. That's the power of the kingdom. Hello? That's the power of the kingdom. Another thing is I don't have to be, I don't have to be delivered from uh, addictions or addictive behavior. I'm already free. My problem is I don't believe that I'm free, which is why I live as though I'm still in a prison cell. But the, the gospel tells me that sin will no longer have dominion over you anymore. It's lost its grip. Just because you stay in its palm doesn't mean it still has a grip on you. It doesn't. You've given it that grip. It doesn't have power over you anymore. Welcome to the kingdom. You see what I'm saying? 
So we already have these things. Do you realize how many diseases and sicknesses and demonic possessions are directly tied to anxiety, worry, and, and despair? Unforgiveness. And unforgiveness? Those things are directly tied to that, and the world is in shackles to these things because they're not delivered from those sins. You are. But if you continue to live in those sins, no wonder you've got problems in your life. Yes or no? Is somebody with me or no? So, I mean, this is a, I just want to make sure that we understand as we're reading forward, there are, you might think, well, I don't understand. I thought that these, this looks like these things come with the kingdom and I've been in the kingdom and I'm not seeing them. Don't, don't think that that's, that that means that you're not in the kingdom. You are in the kingdom. If you've made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life and you are bearing fruit in that union with him, you are his child. The question is, you need to be asking another question. You shouldn't be asking um, has there been a bait and switch? Was I was I told that we were going to get these things, and when we got here, it was it was uh, you know it wound up being something different or less than what I the, what was advertised. What you need to recognize is that you know maybe maybe I'm now a couple of days out into the wilderness, and God's expecting some trust out of me. Maybe He's expecting me to grow up. Maybe He's expecting more of Jesus to be formed in me, which is the basis of the prayer, by the way. I pray that you prosper and be in physical health even as or to the degree that you're growing up in Christ. But if you're not growing up in Christ, I really don't pray that for you. Because, because if you were to continue increase in health and prosperity, even though you are not growing in Christ, that's a false message. I'm enforcing bad behavior, rewarding bad behavior. Amen? And we can't have that. Amen? Now, you might also ask, I just have these things keep on coming to me, even though I would like to keep moving forward with the message. Um, yeah, there are people in the body of Christ that will increase in wealth, even if they're not increasing in Christ. But that has nothing to do with them personally. That has to do with a calling that they've received. Okay? God has given them the power to increase in wealth. And he did it to use them as a minister to the body of Christ in order to be a conduit through which money flows. It's not about them. It's about the body of Christ. It's about the kingdom of God. Um, and so they might increase in wealth, but I can almost guarantee they're not going to be increasing in health. Okay? Uh, so, you know, so that there, there, there are some, uh, some side issues that we'd have to deal with. We were going to explore the depths of all of this, but we're not, that's not the focus today. I just thought I threw the, a few of those out just because you know, I thought these might be questions that pop up in your mind. So in Matthew chapter 10, starting back in verse 1 again, Jesus called his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits so they could cast them out and heal every kind of disease and sickness. Now, these are the names of the 12 apostles. The first, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, um, uh, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. Uh, I'm sure he just loved carrying that name around with him. Uh, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, uh, Simon, the zealot, and uh, Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Jesus sent these 12 out instructing them as follows. And there's your one of your examples of those who will come to Jesus at the end who have worked miracles in his name and yet say, I depart from me, I never knew you. Judas was one of them. Judas never knew Jesus intimately and Jesus never knew him intimately. He had an earthly relationship with him, but there was no intimacy there. Hello? And yet, did he work miracles? Yeah, in fact, Jesus gave him authority to cast out demonic spirits. But in the end, there was no intimacy, right? So there's just one example. Because I know that came up the other day and there were some questions, so I just thought I'd throw that out there as, your, as a token example. Verse 5, Jesus sent these 12 out, instructing them as follows. So this is where we're going to draw some of our conclusions of how to be the guy who turns one mina into ten. Yes or no? Are you following what I'm saying? This is our king sending us out with authority. So what mina do we have? It's authority. That's the mina. Okay? The mina is the authority that you've been given. Now, the authority can take all kinds of forms. And we've spent time with this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 before. Um, we may have to revisit it again. But if you remember, there were three divisions in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. There are the gifts that the Spirit gives, and that's given to every child of God. Every child of God receives a gift from the Holy Spirit. Every one of us do. Okay? Yes, you guys are tracking with me. Yes, you get at least some nods. Okay, that's good. So, 
And, and that is part of your mina. That's part of your talent. Okay. I don't like using the word talent because in our mind, it turns into a, a, you know, what we call talents. And that's not what it means. It was a money, a monetary figure. So, um, so the, 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 the mina that Jesus gives us when we come to Christ is we received each one. Remember, it says he, he, uh, he, he who, um, who, who died and rose on high and he gave gifts to men. Right. And you're one of the people, meaning mankind, right? He gave, you gifts. So that's one of the meanest. What are you doing with it? Okay. He also gave you jurisdictional authority, which is your position in the body. Remember, there's gifts given by the Spirit. Then there's a placement of the body that's given by the Lord. Then at the end, the Father sets some in the body of Christ as energies. They're pastors, prophets, evangelists, pastor, teachers, all that kind of group of people. Those people the Father gives. Jesus, is, as the head of the body, determines whether you're a toe whether you're an eyeball, whether you're an ear, where you are and how you function the body, right? Do you, my ear functions in a certain job, doesn't it? Yes. It doesn't try to do what my, my tongue does. It does what it does, right? It's only got jurisdictional authority. It has no authority over my toe, right? It only does what it was called to do. And if it functions well, then me, the, the head of this body, is going to be very happy with it. I'm going to say, good little ear. You know, enter into the joy of your Lord because <laughs> you did a good little job as an heir. You see what I'm saying? Your function in the body, that's delegated by Jesus. So both of those have to do with being a good steward over your mina. You have a gift and a place, or in other words, a sphere of authority. Part of the, the sphere of everybody's authority in the, in the world, um, in, in the body of Christ, is their immediate family, both their natural, physical family and their church family. But then outside of that, you also have a sphere. Whoever it is that you run into is within your sphere. Okay? Those are people that God expects you to be a, a, a delegated, um, um, as we were saying this morning, ambassador representing him. Amen? And what you do in all of those encounters is your stewardship that you will have to give to him at the end. Is everybody with me? Yes or no? I'm not losing anybody, am I? This is... Really, this is kind of simple, really, to be honest with you. This is not hard. You did have a question, though. Go ahead. Uh, once the gift is given, it doesn't change. It never changes. Not as far as I know. I mean, the Bible doesn't go out of its way to say. In fact, if you read in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it doesn't indicate. It, if you read it in one translation, it sounds as though the Spirit of God gives a gift as is needed on an as-needed basis to his people. Read another way through another translation that makes it sound like the gift he gave you is the one you have, and that's the one you're stuck with. I don't know which is true, and quite honestly, couldn't care less because you know, you we know for a fact we can flow in all of the gifts, can't we? Yes, I mean, as if there's no one else present and God needs a manifestation of gift, guess who he's going to use? You, because you're there, so he's very practical. Um, is there one that you are going to excel in? More than others. Yes, I think so. But your desire does play a role in this because otherwise, why would Paul say, seek and covet the best gifts? Why would you do that if you couldn't receive more or if what you have could not possibly change? So, you know, you've got those things. But, you know, beyond that, I don't really know. And again, it doesn't matter because I, I got news for you. The, the little bit that I know about what gift I have um, I'm doing good just to keep that one ball in the air, much less having two or three to juggle. So, uh, you know, uh, there might be other people out there that can keep 10 balls in the air at one time. I'm like, good for you. I'm glad. Um, I'm just going to keep on doing this. <laughs> throwing my one ball up in the air, catching it, throwing up in the air, catching it. Yes, Terry. I think it goes back to not that we should ignore that. I mean, we should continue to be aware of it, but I think it goes back again to the fact that if you're paying attention to your relationship with God growing, that's going to come automatically. Yes, exactly. Amen. Because because the gifts, the desire for the gifts has got to be for the sake of the edification of the body, which that verse goes on to say. It can't be so that I might just have another gift, but seek to excel for the sake of love that I might minister to the body of Christ. Amen. So, and that's going to automatically spring, like Terry was just saying, out of your zeal and your love for Christ. The more devoted you are to him, the more you're going to want to see people set free and enter into his kingdom and into the safety of his lordship. And so you're going to find gifts popping up pretty regular in one fashion or another. So, yes, go ahead. Well, I just also say that because it, it will, you'll find it coming. Because I, 
I, I'm grateful for the little examples God gives in our lives, but I remember the one particular time that um, was just really, really, really strong in my life where God just had a encounter, so to speak, where he claimed some things out of me that needed to be just gut-rooted. And in the days that followed that, I felt like there was more of a sensitivity and there was a couple of gifts that just flowed more easily than they ever had before. Yeah. And um, unfortunately... I don't think it's been quite that clear ever since, but it just shows all the more that the, the stronger and closer you are with the Lord, the more you're walking regularly with the Lord, the more he's going to, more of those things are going to come out. Yeah. And, and a key phrase there is walking with him as Lord, not just as my savior and my friend and all that other stuff we like to fall into, which is they have, they have their place and they are true, but these things all manifest in the kingdom. And so they're very much Lord King oriented, aren't they? So, okay, so let's move on. It says, Jesus sent these 12 out, instructing them as follows. Do not go on a road that leads to Gentile regions and do not enter any Samaritan town. Go instead to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So Jesus directs where they went and to whom. Just like he does now under the new covenant, as I just mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He also gave the, gave, gives them the message. In verse 7, he says, as you go, preach this message. There you go. I mean, did, did they have to wonder, what do I teach when I get there? No, no, no. He told them. This is it. The kingdom of heaven is near. That's a really long message. Kingdom of heaven's here. It, it's right at the door. I mean, just if you blink, you're going to miss it. It's coming. I'm telling you, it's right here. Get ready. Repent. The kingdom of God's coming. I mean, that was their message right there. I mean, did God probably give the disciples parables and, 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 and teachings to use that accommodated this and drove the point on? No doubt. They had been with a great teacher all this time. They probably re-preached some of the things they heard from him, undoubtedly, right? But the, the focus of what they were teaching was, hey, repent because the kingdom of God, heaven is near, Right? Then he said, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons, freely you have received, freely give. That's part of the kingdom. Amen? You freely received, freely give. Now, again, there are there's some, some catches to this. Like I said, you look at the ministry of Jesus. He did not go to a city and stay there for a month campaign healing people every day. He went in there and he preached the message maybe for a day or two or whatever, and with the testing signs, and then he left. And, and, and usually there were no more signs given. That was it. You already had your signs. Now your job is to respond by faith, period. Amen? So, so we have to make sure that we, we don't read into a passage something it doesn't say as much as we don't want to miss something it does say. Amen? Now, this sounds very much like the latter part of Mark 16, when he said, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, um, uh, um, cast out demons, freely you received, freely give. It sounds very much like the latter part of Mark 16. However, as I was telling Pam on Wednesday night after church, um, this latter portion of Mark 16 is not in any of the oldest copies of the book of Mark. And, and anybody who looks in the Greek, that knows Greek, that reads these ancient Greek manuscripts where it start, first starts appearing, they can tell it was added. It was not original to the text, okay? And in fact, in, in my, like in my Bible, I was just looking at my, one of my translations last night, it starts, I forget what verse it starts in, it's much further up than the verse we're starting with today, because I'm going to read Mark 16 to you, but it starts with not just a single, but two brackets, and it ends with two brackets, and there's a note that says, this is not in the earliest copies, this was added, Okay. Uh, that's not a question. We know it. It's it's not a, well, you know, we think it was added. No, we know that was added. This was something that was not part of Mark's original gospel. Um, now, there might be reasons for it. I'm of the school of thought that what we have in our Bible is what God intended us to have. And so what we have in Mark's gospel, if you were to end the chapter where it actually ends, it's almost in the middle of a thought that he never finishes. So is it possible that someone came in and finished, in future copies, finished what Mark actually had said, but we just don't have any ancient copies that show that? Yeah, that's quite possible. So my point is, I, the fact that it is in Mark 16 tells me it belongs there, but I, you do need to understand it was undoubtedly added later. It was a different hand. If it's different, it's different words. 
Um, uh, they, the phrases are not consistent with the way Mark talked or wrote, spoke or wrote. And so we know it was added. There's no question. But I believe that it still represents the gospel of Jesus Christ. Is everybody still with me? Okay. Uh, why do I even bother telling you that? Because I think it's important. You need to know your Bible. You should know your Bible. You should, better that you hear that from me than someone to catch you off guard one day and say, well, you know that doesn't even belong in the Bible. And they start throwing facts at you and you're like, oh my gosh, I don't know what to say to this. You know, well, that's not the first time you needed to have heard that. You needed to have heard that from a shepherd. They explained it to you. <laughs> okay, so don't freak out. They're right. It was added. But God preserved it. So I'm guessing it must belong there. I'm not losing any any sleep over it. So Mark 16, we're just we're skipping out of where we are in, in Matthew 10 just for a moment and reading Mark 16, starting verse 15. We're just reading five verses. Okay. It says, um, sorry, verse 15. It says, And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The one who believes and is baptized will be saved. Now you need to understand that that terminology is all the way through the New Testament. Uh, it's only like in two places that you can find in the entire Bible where salvation is said to happen without mentioning baptism. It's just not there. So, um, so is it important? Yeah, I think so. Is it because something magical happens in the water? No, absolutely not. Um, I believe, I believe, does anybody hear Mark say, I, I believe, this is Mark's opinion, it's not on par with scripture. But I believe that baptism was just a, the thing that God chose to use, especially in the early church, as the means by which they gave a living testimony to the whole world around them that they are now in Christ. Because baptism was something that was practiced by almost every major religion back then. When you were baptized into a religion, it said you were now devoted to it. Okay? So God just, rather than reinvent the wheel, just use what we've already got. And so I believe that what this was, was because remember, the Bible doesn't just say that if I will confess Jesus as Lord, I confess him before men, don't I? Yes or no? Yes. That, I mean, the, the Bible is very clear that says if I fail to confess him before men, then Jesus will also fail to confess me before the Father. So the confession of our mouth that Jesus is my Lord is got to be a very public matter, doesn't it? Amen? And baptism did that. So you didn't just believe in your heart. The confession of your mouth was through being baptized. Okay? That's why I, Mark, believes that you can't find but like two places in the whole Bible where you see salvation apart from baptism. Okay? that Again, that's Mark's belief. Could there be some something about baptism that actually seals your salvation? Maybe, but I really don't think so. I don't think there's anything magical about the water at all. Okay, um, I think that, like the one passage says, it says that it's not a removing of the filth of the flesh, but an answer of a good conscience before God. That's what baptism is. But the good conscience needs to answer. So do it, right? If you can do it, do it. And I think that's what it's talking about in Paul's writing where he says, what do we do then for, for those that are baptized for the dead? Because there's a lot of people who gave their life for Christ before they could be baptized. Does that mean they're lost? Of course not. But some people would take it upon themselves to be baptized publicly in that person's name as a declaration to say, I know that that person had dedicated themselves to Christ before they died. In fact, that was the reason for their death. And they were baptized on their behalf. Not because that without that, the person would be lost. The guy on the cross couldn't be baptized. And yet he made it, right? So, but, so you see what I'm saying? But I think, that it, I think the bottom line is, if you can, you should. Unless the day you get born again, you were killed, in which case you wouldn't be hearing me talk, be baptized, period. Just, just, that don't worry about it. Just do it, right? And that way you don't have to worry if it's attached to salvation or not because you did it. Yeah, so, huh? A friend of mine yesterday was telling me that there were a number, I, I don't remember, several, I could say maybe a hundred more people who had been baptized in mm -hmm. different churches. Beautiful. I love that multiple churches were involved. That's yes. beautiful. Excellent. Love that. Uh, what I'd love to hear even more is that they let their, their closest of kin or the person that led them to the Lord baptize them. I would love that rather than just I being the pastors. Place, but, uh, but that's awesome. I love it. So, yes, ma'am. Was baptism kind of replaced uh, circumcision in a way? No. 
Um, he said that the Gentiles didn't need to be circumcised. That's right. They did. But the Jews did. Well, the Jews didn't have to be after Christ died and rose again. No, they no longer had to be. No, that was something that, that, that was a, an ongoing debate between Paul and some of the saints in Jerusalem, um, even some of the elders in Jerusalem. But I think that eventually it became very well known that no, no, no Jew or anybody has to be circumcised in order to be born again. That is by faith in Christ alone, period. He said, because yeah, Paul goes out of his way to say circumcision avails nothing. Well, I mean, well, nothing means nothing. So obviously, well, you can nothing. Well, that they were only eight days old. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Where's the heart in that? Exactly. Yeah. So I, th yeah, there's no, there's no, there's no problem with it. But, um, but being circumcised or not is not an issue. Um, uh, the only problem with circumcision is if you do it as a means for salvation. Now you got a problem. Now you've fallen from grace. But the act of there's, it's not sin. You know, as long as you're not looking to it as a means for salvation, right? So, uh, yes, Terry. No, okay. So let's go on. It says, um, go into all the world, uh, preach the gospel to every creature. The one who believes and is baptized will be saved, but the one who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. Now, one translation I have, it says, these signs will accompany those who believe these things. But I actually I think it actually just means believe says, in my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new languages. They will pick up snakes with their hands, and whatever poison they drink will not harm them. They will place their hands on the sick, and they will be well. Now, this is not an advocation to go pick up dumb snakes. It just means like when, when um, it, it had a metaphorical meaning that had to do with the enemy, but because, you know, he's represented by a serpent. But also, you know, remember when Paul went to the Isle, I think it was of Crete, uh, when he was putting uh, wood in the fire, a viper reached out and lashed onto his hand, and the people kind of stood back and just watched for him to fall over dead because it was a, it was a venomous snake, and he just shook it off in the fire and didn't worry about it. Um, but he was aware of his kingdom authority, right? He's like, well, that can't hurt me. I'm 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 not of your kingdom. <laughs> I'm in a different kingdom. That doesn't affect me. I play by different rules. And he just shook it off into the fire. Um, so, yeah, but there again, that's, there's a difference between that and deliberately handling snakes um, that are venomous. That's just stupid. And at that point, you're tempting God, right? And that's, that's just called dumb. Anyway, verse 9 says, After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. Then uh, they went out and proclaimed everywhere, while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the word through the accompanying signs. Now, this was after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, wasn't it? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So this was the early church, and this wasn't just apostles. He says, these signs will follow those who believe. He didn't say, these signs will follow apostles. He said, these signs will follow those who believe, right? So it's a, it's a sign that follows believers, yes? But... Who was who was it that they were delivering from demonic control? The lost, not other Christians. Who were they? Who were they laying hands on to heal the sick when they were preaching the gospel? The lost, right? Are you seeing what I'm saying? So we, we need to read things in context. It says now for now, for certain these apostles did go on out and preach and deliver and heal in Jesus' name. Then Jesus tells them. Not to provide it now in verse, uh, as we're picking back up in, in, in Matthew chapter 10, picking up in verse 9, Jesus now tells them to not provide for themselves, but to live by the preaching of the gospel. Now, that doesn't apply to every child of God, it applies to those who are sent out. Okay? Um, it says, Do not take gold or silver, picking up in verse 9, do not take gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for the journey or an extra tunic, or sandals, or staff, for the worker deserves his provisions. God will take care of you, right? Whenever you enter into a town or a village, now listen to these words, this is very important. Whenever you enter into a town or village, find out who is worthy there, and stay with them until you leave. Well, who's worthy? Those who believe. Those who will receive the message. They're worthy, right? Very good, excellent. He says, and as you enter the house, greet those within. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come on it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return back to you. And if anyone will not welcome you or listen to your message, shake the dust off your feet as you leave that house or that town. He, notice he doesn't say, 
argue with them and try to convince them. Okay. He said, if they don't welcome you and they don't want to listen, then stop talking. Walk away. You got better things to do and riper fields to go to. Yes or no? Now, what do you do? And I understand that's the immediate question. What do I do with people that I live with? I have a child that's not born again. I got a wife or a husband that's not born again. I've got, you know, a, a mother that's living with me and she's not born again. What do I do about people I can't freaking walk away from? You know, <laughs> well, you live before them, but shut your mouth. Pray for God to open up a door where you can say something, but live it. You know what I'm saying? Trust me. Your light, they're going to see. And, and remember, Paul's admonition, particularly to wives. And I'm not, I'm not picking. I'm just saying, typically, the gift of gab is in the female variety. And he said, your husband will be wor one without a word. Don't nag them. Leave them alone. Just live it in front of them. Be submissive to them. Obey your husband, even though he's lost, unless, of course, he asks you to do something that is contrary to God's word. Like, I want you to go rob a bank. I want you to murder your mother because I can't stand her. Anything stupid like that, don't, don't listen to that, okay? But other than that, obey your husbands, right? And they will be one, if they're going to be one, it'll be without you saying anything. Right? So don't don't wear that as, as a shame that you can't say something to your husband. That's not unique to you. Paul, that was Paul's advice to everybody who every woman that's born again to a non-born again husband, shut your mouth. <laughs> Live it in front of them. Trust me, they're gonna get it. The fact that you are light and their darkness is going to either win them or annoy them, but they're not missing it. They will see it. Is everybody with me? Does that, that doesn't absolve you from saying something if a door opens. And should you pray for a door to open? Yes. But the biggest thing you need to be praying for is that God will get his word into their lives, whether it be through you or someone else, because you don't care who it comes from. It could be a squirrel for all you care. You just want him to get the message, right? Amen. So just let God do his thing and keep your mouth shut and live it in front of them. That's what you do. So there's your answer to the question nobody asked me, but I know that you're thinking it. So now, if anyone will not welcome you or listen to your message, shake the dust off your feet as you leave that house or that town. I tell you the truth. Jesus usually doesn't use that phrase. Whenever he does, he, your ears should per perk up. Is everybody with me? Because yeah. this is like a double exclamation point. I'm telling you the truth. It will be more tolerable, more bearable, for the region of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. If they reject you, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting him. And D-Day's coming. Amen? And so, you know, don't, don't take it personally. Just walk away. Just walk away. Jesus encouraged them to be smart, but harmless. Wary, but unafraid and confident in their message and that the one uh, ha, who, who has sent them will always be with them. We'll see that as we continue reading here, starting verse 16. I am sending you out like sheep surrounded by wolves. Well, gee, thanks. <laughs> you know, I'm, well, you know, at least he was honest about it, right? You know, uh, I'm sending you out like sheep surrounded by wolves. So be wise. It's so sad that he has to tell his children to not be stupid. You know, don't, this means, in other words, don't run through a campus waving that's, uh, that is protesting Jewish, uh, the Jewish nation and run through with a Jewish flag in your hand. If you get shot, you're an idiot. You, you weren't being smart. That, that, that falls right into the category of not smart. Would you agree with me? Right? If you see a group of people that are violently hostile to the gospel and you think, well, gee, this is a great place to start preaching, you're an idiot. You didn't read what he said. What did he say? If they're worthy, continue. If not, walk away. If you already know they're hostile to the gospel, then don't even talk. Just walk away. Amen? He says, beware people because they will hand you over to, to, over to councils and flog you in their synagogues. I mean, bad things are going to happen. Don't be the dumb person that makes them happen. 
You know what I mean? So I'm back at verse 16 again. It says, I'm sending you out like sheep surrounded by wolves, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Be smart, but also make sure that you're innocent so that even when people do attack you, they're going to have to fabricate something because you didn't do something wrong. Hello? Be innocent. Beware of people because they will hand you over to councils and flog you in their synagogues. And you will be brought before governors and kings because of me as a witness to them and to the Gentiles. Whenever they hand you over for trial, don't worry. That's easy to say. You're not the one that's about to get flogged. (laughs) It's like, well, what's worrying going to do? That's not going to change anything, right? Instead, what what are we encouraged to do instead of being anxious? Appeal to our Father in heaven. Right? And then what the Bible tells us in Philippians, don't be anxious for anything. But 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 instead, in, through prayer with a, that's got a heart filled with thanksgiving and gratitude to God, make your request known to God. And the peace of God will just cover you and mount up a garrison over your heart and your mind to defend you. Amen? That's what you do. Right? So he says, Whenever they hand you over for trial, don't worry about how you're going to speak or what you're going to say. For what you should say will be given to you at that time. Don't, don't, don't be patient yourself and, and coming up with a speech. Just, just turn your brain off and worship God and just trust that the Father will fill your mouth when it's necessary. You want to know how Jesus had wisdom that confounded people so they couldn't even answer? They just walked away and left him alone? He didn't come up with pre-made speeches in his own mind. He waited and let his father fill his mouth. The wisdom that you come see coming out of Jesus' mouth didn't originate from his brain. He was a human being just like you and I. He had to depend upon the father. He's not giving advice he doesn't follow. Amen? He says, For it is not you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. You want to have sweet communion with your father, you're going to find that some of the best communion you have ever had is going to be in times of suffering. Paul said, talked about the fellowship of his sufferings. Because that's where I meet with him. Amen? He says, brother will hand over brother to death and father his child. Children will rise up against their parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by everyone because of my name. But the one who endures to the very end will be the one that is saved. If you halfway through it say this cost is too much, I'm done, then you're done. But he said, those who will endure to the end, those are the ones that will be saved. Whenever they persecute you in one town, flee, go to another. Well, that sounds like good advice. (laughs) You know what I mean? I mean, he didn't say stick it out and just keep on, just keep on poking them with a spiritual stick to stir up trouble. No. If they begin to persecute you, leave. And don't just leave. Run. Flee. You're like, well, God would never say that. Well, I don't know. It's, it's in my Bible. It's even in red, right? <laughs> Whenever they persecute you in one time, then then flee to another. Don't stay there. Don't be dumb. Right? What did he say? Be smart, right? I tell you the truth, you will not finish going through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Now, this is a little side issue I'm just going to address real quickly, and then we're probably going to have to wrap things up because we're at an hour already. Um, If you remember, Jesus' favorite title by which he referred to himself was the Son of Man. He called himself that more than he called himself anything. Okay? Uh, In fact, out of the 87 times that phrase is used in the New Testament, 83 of them are Jesus saying it about himself. There's only four more. Jesus constantly referred to him as himself as the son of, not a, that's different, the son of man, which pointed back to Daniel. Remember he said, I saw one like the son of man, not a son of man, but the son of man. And he, that was the one who did the triumphant entry and was cut off and then was restored. And his kingdom lasts forever. That's the Son of Man Daniel talked about. That was the Messiah, Jesus. So by calling himself the Son of Man, he was calling himself the fulfillment of the prophecy of Daniel, the king that would reign forever. So was he, was he, mis, was he misrepresenting himself? No. 
In fact, it was right with his, it, it fit right in with his messages. We're always about the kingdom. And so he's therefore saying, and, and not only that, I'm the king, right? I'm the son of man, right? So uh, that, that's very, very important. And now, uh, now some translations may differ a little bit and say they'll blend a son of man with the word the son of man. And I think that's a problem. But I think that in most cases, when the phrase is the son of man, it's always referring to Jesus as king and Messiah. There are times when Jesus is referred to as a son of man, and it's just meaning that he was also human. Okay? Uh, because the phrase a son of man just means you're born from a human. Right? The son of man is a different issue. That's a specific reference. Now, the reason I bring this up is because of the fact that he says here, I tell you the truth, you will not finish going through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Well, if you are the Son of Man, you're already here. What are you talking about? Well, he's clearly not talking about the Millennial Kingdom because a lot of them have already, they, they not only have already gone through all those cities, they're already long dead, Right. He's talking about either his triumphant entry where it, all of Israel recognized him for a day or two as king or when he was crucified and rose again as the Lord of the kingdom. Either one of those. And they're only like seven days apart, either one of those. Okay. So that's what he meant by the son of man will come. Okay. Probably it meant his return after his rapture. Okay. Um, just to throw that out there, because that's, that's actually, that's actually shipped right to a few people because they're like, well, that can't be true. I'm like, well, actually, if you understand the phrase, the son of man, yeah, it is true. It was true by his rising from the dead because the kingdom really wasn't Jesus's until he established the kingdom and the kingdom was established at his death, burial, and resurrection. That's when his kingdom was established. So when he returned from the dead was him coming back as the son of man. You see what I'm saying? So it doesn't break scripture. It is scripture. Okay, now going on to verse 24, it says, uh, back in, in um, where we have been in, in Matthew 10, says, A disciple is not greater than his teacher, nor a slave greater than his master. It is enough for a disciple to become like his teacher, and the slave like his master. If they have called the head of the house Beelzebub, what do you think they're going to call you? Right? If they, if they call the head of the, ma the, 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 the kingdom, you know, a son of the devil, what do you think they're going to call you? Right? <laughs> So it's not going to get better, right? Don't be afraid of them, though. Don't, I'll tell you, the enemy, the, the, one of the biggest tactics of the enemy is to intimidate you. Yeah, he, I'm telling you, he can just drill the, the floor out from underneath your feet by intimidating you. And if you just go and determine, you know what? I've got nothing to be embarrassed about. And I know that they are not going to get what I'm saying. And they're going to walk away thinking they won this argument. But you know what? In, in, in a thousand years, they're going to already know I was the one that was right. So this really isn't about me being right. So why am I being intimidated? I'm just going to tell them the truth. And if, and if they try to intimidate me, I'm just going to be, fine. I'm not intimidated, but go ahead. Throw threats at me. Call me names. That's fine. I'm, I'm a big boy. I'm no longer in preschool. That's not going to bother me. Right? Amen? Yes or no? It says, don't be afraid of them, for nothing is hidden that will not be revealed. Notice that's what Jesus said there. They're not going to necessarily be convinced right now, but there's a day they're going to be fully convinced. So just don't worry about it, right? For nothing's hidden that's not going to be revealed, and nothing is secret that will not be made known. What I say to you in the dark, I'm telling you, tell it in the light. And what is whispered in your ear, proclaim it from the housetops. Do not be ashamed. And do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Instead, fear the one who is able to destroy both the body and the soul in hell. Are two spar aren't two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. Even all of the hairs of your head are numbered. So don't be afraid. Three times he said, don't be afraid. You are more valuable than countless sparrows. Whoever then acknowledges me before people, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But make no mistake, whoever denies me before people, I will also deny him before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace on the earth. Far from it. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For, and what is a sword? A sword is a representation of judgment. It divides between two things, which is what judgment is. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. 
Whoever therefore loves his father or mother more than me is not even worthy of me. And whoever loves his son or daughter more than me is not even worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not even worthy of me. Don't even bother. If that's not, if your level of doesn't love doesn't reach there, then just don't even bother following. Just, just don't bother. I, you know what? I, as much as I try, I think I only can remember one or two times I ever heard anything approaching that in a church just before um, an altar call. But I have heard it a few times, just a couple of times. But they're like, you know what? It, 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 you come to Christ. But, you know, I'm not going to make it easy on you. I'm not going to ask everybody to bow their heads and you raise your head si hand silently. No, you're going to have to walk yourself up here, march your rear end up here to the front in front of everybody. And I'm just telling you that if you don't love, if you are not dedicated to Christ and willing to give yourself to him more than your devotion to your own husband, wife, and children, then do not bother coming to this altar. Well, that was a true message. They told him the truth. Well, I'm not going to get as many takers then. Well, good. Because the only takers I want are the ones that mean it. Otherwise, it's just meaningless numbers. Yes or no? Right? I mean, I, I was just reading the other day that this praise report on, on LinkedIn had this huge ocean of people in this huge arena, like a sports arena someplace. I don't even think it was in America. And it said 60,000 people give their life to Jesus today. I said, eh. you had 60,000 people that may raise their hand. You probably have about maybe a thousand that gave their life to Christ. There's a big difference between a bunch of people who will say something and people who really meant it and will follow it through before they get by the time they get to the parking lot. Yes or no? Okay, you know, just because there's a bunch of hands and a bunch of cards being signed doesn't mean that they actually met Christ. Whoever loves these people more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life, there is thirty nine. Whoever finds his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel, the same will find it. Whoever receives you receives me. This is where we get, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me, right? And whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. Whoever receives a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. Who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man will receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives up only even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of even a disciple, it, I tell you the truth, he will not lose his reward. It doesn't have to be in my name. You could do it in the name of a disciple, and that would be fine because I identify with my people, my people identify with me. Right? So the lesson of the parable of the Minas is not that uh, it, it, it's not the same thing necessarily. Well, it may. It may or may not be the exact same as the talents as well, the parable of the talents as well. But it, it is that all of us who are his servants should be and remain busy in the work of the kingdom until he returns. We should be doing that. The work or business of the kingdom is both internal and external. And I'm wrapping up right here. I just want to make sure I connect these dots before we close. All right. The work of the kingdom is internal and external. In fact, the external means nothing if you haven't done the internal. Okay. Internal, internally, the work of the kingdom is loving, loyal devotion to Jesus as our Lord and King, which is evidenced by how we live our life. That's internal. Externally, there is a living, a sharing, and a proclamation of the kingdom and King to both saved and lost to invite, invite all who will come to do so, to bow the knee. That's to other believers as well. I mean, we're, we're constantly encouraging one another to follow after Christ, aren't we? Amen. That's part of a, your first ministry is to the body of Christ. The, sir, the world is secondary. That is solid throughout Scripture. Even Jesus, when he was telling his disciples, I don't want you to go to the Gentiles. We'll get to them eventually, but I want you to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel first. Right? Because those were the people that were in covenant with God at the time. Now, the only people that are in covenant with God are those people that are born again. So you go to your brother and your sister first before going to the world. Amen? So the business of the kingdom is to be busy and occupied producing gain for the kingdom from the investment our Lord and King has made in us. To do so with simplicity and with wisdom, not overstaying our welcome and moving on to more productive fields. Jesus told the crowd who followed him in John 6 that the work of God was to believe in the one the Father sent. So that's part of your work, is ongoing faith in him. Okay? We spent some time two weeks ago pointing out that belief is always 
accompanied by works. In fact, belief always produces correlating works. One of the works Jesus did, which he called doing the business of his father, would that not fit in with this parable, therefore? Doing the business of the kingdom? was when in his youth he was found studying and sharing the gospel in the temple when his parents were looking for him. He said, did you not know I must be about my father's, what? Business, the work of the kingdom. What was he doing? He was reading and teaching the scriptures. Amen? Jesus was teaching the disciples before the kingdom was open to the whole world, and so they were told to to stick to Jewish areas. So, How does that change the work of the kingdom for us? Well, our call is not to Jews or Gentiles so much. Instead, we're called to both believers and unbelievers, but believers are first. The kind of life that we should live towards believers is this. We should minister to their spiritual and natural needs as much as we are able. Be like-minded, sympathetic, compassionate, willing to suffer for one another. Avoid sibling squabbles, but walk in love with one another and aid one another in regard to sinful and righteous behavior. If you see your brother caught up in a sin, go to them. You're like, well, I'm not my brother's keeper. Well, then you didn't read the Bible. Yes, you are. Absolutely you are. The kind of life that we are to live towards the world is we're supposed to be salt and light, which includes the charge to not be deluded by the influence of the world and living lives of godless, uh, godlessness before the world so that they can see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. If you're living just like the world, they're not going to see good works, and they're not going to glorify God. You know, I, I said, you know, a, a light is not put under a bushel, but it's, it's set out on a candlestick so it gives light to everyone who's in the house, right? City on a, a city on a hill cannot be hid. Be salt, right? This includes our love for each other, which is now how Jesus said that the world would even know who we are. It's our love for one another. Notice he didn't say your love for the world. The Bible said, you love your brother, and by that the world will know that you are my disciples. Because you love one another, not because you love the world. Hello? Now, are we to have a love for the world, meaning the lost in it? Yes. But our love for them is not the same as our love for our brother and our sister in Christ. It's not the same. Um, Also, we are to be gentle and respectful towards them and never retaliating or defending ourselves, but only blessing. In this parable, we learn that the world are those, uh, sorry, the the world are the subjects who did not want the nobleman to rule over them. You see, their delegation was a rejection, both of the nobleman and those doing business on his behalf, right? They said the delegation saying, we don't want this man to rule over us. It was a rejection not only of him, but also of the the servants who'd been left behind doing the business of the kingdom. They rejected the message they brought, the life they lived, and the kingdom in which they served. On the flip side, this means that they were not reject uh, that they were not rejecting the one servant who did not do the work of the kingdom. Remember the one guy that didn't, didn't do anything; they weren't rejecting him. That that servant blended in with them so well as to be indiscernible and indistinguishable from them. Right? He went to them. He was just one of them. Finally, we learned that upon Jesus' return, he first dealt with the ten servants, which are broken down into three categories, by, by uh, only mentioning, but, uh, but we're only mentioning three of them. Uh, you know, by mentioning only three of them. To the first two, he gave praise and honor them with authority. We learn that regardless of the amount of effectiveness of their work done by his servants, those who accomplished work until he returned were honored by ruling with him with authority granted in step with the effectiveness of their service. Right? And the final servant is called wicked. And in Matthew's account of the same servant, that one is cast out into outer darkness. The takeaways, therefore, are this. Examine yourself. Just like Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24 says, Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my concerns and my thoughts and see if there's any offensive way in me and then lead me in the way everlasting. Invite that regularly in your life. Be passionate about the kingdom and the king. Be prepared for his return by doing business until he returns. Be surrendered in your servitude towards him and be faithful. That's it, right? And that was the message that he taught. Amen? So, are there any questions before we close out today? Yes, ma'am. 
just to be clear. Yes. If there is a need and there is only one per between two people and there's only one person you can help. Mm -hmm. it's to You're going to have to be led by the Spirit of God at that point. It's not necessary to be a brother or sister. Oh, no, 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 no. We always prefer the body of Christ first. Always. Okay. Without question. Yeah, that that's substantiated by many passages throughout the New Testament. Yes. We serve the body of Christ first, then the world. Absolutely. Okay. Now, you also need to understand that certain monies, especially if you're in a ministry, are designated. And if money is designated for evangelistic purposes, I can't take from that and minister to a saint. Because it was designated. You know what I mean? The people that gave it, gave it with this intention. Don't, you're, you're misrepresenting them and not being a good steward of the money that's been given to you if you misrepresent it by spending it on something different than they gave it for, right? right? Which is why accountability in ministry is very, very important, right? But yeah, that's the answer to your question. We always minister to this the body of Christ first. And again, the passage in the New Testament that says, if anyone contemplates his brother who's in need, and and um and shuts up his heart of compassion from how can he say the love of God abides in him? The 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 wording there, again, if you were to go to the Greek, you'd understand that's a whole lot. It reads much different in the Greek. Essentially says, if you see a brother who is constantly in need, the wording there, when it says you see your brother in need, it doesn't mean they have a need today. I can't pay my rent this month, but usually I can. He's not talking about that. You if you can help them, that's great. But this isn't talking about this. It's not, the wording there is in the continuous present. It means if you see a brother who is constantly in need, that's their situation. That's their statement, right? And you have the means wherewith you can meet them. And not, 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 it says, doesn't just say if you possess the ability to help them. The wording there is also in the constant. It means you're a person who constantly possesses more than enough. Okay? And if you being the person who constantly always has more than they need can look upon a brother who's constantly in need and do nothing to help them with the abundance you have, how could you possibly claim that you know God? Well, that's a good question. But lots of Christians have been brought into bondage and condemnation because they had an extra $10 at the end of the month, which is so rare, it's unbelievable. And they run to a brother who just because they can't keep their act straight is always in, uh, you know, having need and they read condemnation of that passage if they don't give that $10 bill to them. That's not what that passage was saying. <laughs> You're not the person that constantly has. And probably that person really isn't constantly in need, right? And so we have to read the passage for what it actually <laughs> says, right? <clears throat> so uh, there, there, there are qualifiers in the scripture. We have to be careful to read them. But nonetheless, um, yeah, we, we are to be an aid to our brothers and our sisters. And one of the best things you can give is time, right? One of the best things you can give is time. Usually, to some degree or another, um, it's free. Time. On some level or another, t typically you're not taking away from time to work to go help somebody. You're, it's when you're, you're free. You go and you minister to them and help them, right? <clears throat> yes, uh-huh. So the, uh, the passage says, if you see a brother sister who's constantly in need. In need. Yes. Yes. And the, the pat. let me let me just look it up real quick. I, I'm sorry? That, yeah. Well again, it's it the passage, it's in first John. Okay, it's in first John three seventeen. Okay, it says <clears throat> Verse 16 says, this is how we have come to know love. He laid down his life for us. We should also lay down our lives for the brethren. If anyone has this world's goods, that the word has means in the continuous present. They always have more than enough. Okay. And he sees his brother constantly in need. The word need is in the continuous present and shuts off his compassion from him. How can he claim that the love of God abides in him? Well, that's a very good question. I mean, any any of us would automatically think the same thing, wouldn't we? This was not saying if you have an extra 10 bucks in your pocket and you see a person in need and you don't give to them, how can you possibly claim the love of God abides in you? That's not what the passage said. You see what I'm saying? Otherwise, we're just constantly going to change who's in need. I just gave my $10, now I'm in need. Give me the $10 back, you know? <laughs> you know I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense. But he's saying if, a per if you are a person who constantly has more than enough and you see your brother, and you don't just see them, you contemplate, you've thought about this brother, not person in the world, 
brother who's constantly in dire need and your abundance could do something to relieve that pressure from them and you shut your heart instead of responding, you actually harden your heart against them? How could you claim God's love abides in that heart? I mean, as, as when you read it like that and understand that's what the Greek is actually saying, doesn't that immediately speak truth to you? Isn't that the truth? Of course it is. You're not hurting the person that's. I mean, if you were to give, if you were to, if that person were to pay that person's rent for the rest of the year, if they're a person that always has an abundance, that probably wouldn't even put a dent in their wallet. So why would you shut your heart of compassion against them? What what's what's what could possibly be in your heart that would shut your heart of compassion against a brother when you've got the means to help them? Right. Well, God says, you know, well, my love certainly doesn't abide there. Right? So uh, so that's what that passage is talking about. Okay? Does that answer your question, Pam? Okay. Anybody else? Okay. So we understand we're talking about the kingdom of God and that each one of us have received gifts. Uh, uh, the biggest gift we received is eternal life. And what you've had, you freely give. Right? And be stewards of the kingdom. You're going to be, some of us are going to be more effective than others, some less than others. But the bottom line isn't how effective, that is a big deal, how effective you are, but at least be effective. Amen? And one of the biggest things that is necessary as proof of doing the work of the kingdom is you being submitted to your king by bearing fruit under the kingdom. Right? Amen? Uh, Peter also draws attention to that as being a work of the kingdom of God as well. Bearing fruit. Right? So it's very, very important. That's where it starts. So, all right, we'll go ahead and close in prayer. Father God. Grace. 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 Grace.